You don't have to do much in range management, whether you're managing livestock or wildlife, before you realize that the number of animals that are out on the range is going to affect the range and the animals, and it's important to manage the stocking rate of animals. So in this presentation, in principles of rangeland management at the University of Idaho, we're going to talk about setting stocking rates. I'm Karen Launchbaugh. Okay, we will talk about stocking rate, but there are other decisions that have to be made on the ground that fall in this general category of grazing principles. The first thing that one decides when they go to the range is what kind of animal to graze. In this case, we're going to talk about livestock species, type, and age of animal. So is it a cow-calf operation? It is a, a, a yearling ewe operation? It, what is it that you're trying to manage for on the range? Of course, we could talk about wildlife too, but it's much more difficult to select a species or type of, live, of wildlife and manage them. So in grazing management, we're usually talking about livestock principles. The next question is how many animals? How many animals are out on the range? How many should be out on the range? That is stocking rate. So we will talk today about stocking rate um, and how, you, how it's set and, and how we manage that. There's a few other things though. Uh, when should we graze the pasture? When should we not graze it? When should we rest it? When should we graze it? All of those questions about how one piece of land is grazed or rested fall under the category of grazing systems. We'll talk about that later in this course. And then finally, animal distribution. That's where animals graze on a landscape. Not surprisingly, animals don't graze landscapes just evenly all the way across. They have their sort of favorite places that they like to graze and rest. Those characteristics are behavioral characteristics that we'll talk about in animal behavior, but it's difficult to, animal, to manage animal distribution, but it sure can be done. So we'll talk about that later. Okay, stocking rate. Focusing in on stocking rate, a very important decision that we make on rangelands. When you get to the heart of it, it's a balance between two things. It's a balance between forage supply and forage demand. The supply is provided by the, the forage that's out on the range and the demand is that which is eaten by the livestock. So we're gonna talk about managing that supply and demand. Some terminology we need to get uh, underway. First is carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the number of animals that a piece of land can support on the long-term basis without causing damage to the land. Remember that rangelands are all grazed in some form or another. They evolved with grazing. So uh, managing the number of animals is important and it can be done in a way that is not damaging to the ecosystem. Um, so, but this is determined largely by, by mother nature, by the type of soil, by the amount of moisture, by the length of the growing season. So the actual carrying capacity is usually decided by things that are outside of the control of management. They're expressed as some unit of animals on some area of land for some amount of time. Generally, we um, look at expressing uh, carrying capacity as acres per AUM per year. We'll talk about AUMs, they're animal unit months, but acres per AUM per year is generally a way that we express stocking, I'm sorry, express carrying capacities on rangeland. Stocking rates? Another matter, that, that is not what Mother Nature deals you, but what you decide as a land manager to put on the ground. So stocking rate is the number of animals a land manager places on a piece of land for a period of time. It's considered one of the most important grazing decisions that we make because it affects some very important aspects of the enterprise. What, what does setting stocking rate affect? Well, the first is that you have to express stocking rates in animal units or animals per area. Harry usually expresses in acres per hectare, and some a unit of time, days, months, years, season, all of those would be appropriate. And it's important because it affects the health and economic returns of the land. So any stocking rate has to have and a number of animals, some area of land, and some period of time, and it's important because it affects health and economic returns and a whole lot of other things about the range. We've been talking about a few terms, and so now we're going to define those. Um, one was an animal unit. So an animal unit um, is an idea that, uh, that animals could be uh, just thought of as just 1,000 pound units. This came about when the Forest Service 
first started permitting grazing in the early part of the 19th century, there weren't very many scales around, so it was difficult to weigh every animal that was put on the range, but they could count them. And so most cows were about a thousand pounds, even though some were a little higher and some were less. They just said, if we count every more animal out there and call them an animal unit, that, that's what the what you know what we try to do. So uh, for a thousand pound animal, uh, one cow, a thousand pounds would be equal one animal unit. For horses, um, a horse would be uh, less, it would take uh, less than a horse to create an animal unit. So horses eat more than cows. So it takes a little more than half of a horse to make an animal unit. Um, steers eat less than a, a mature cow. So it takes a few more steers to make an animal unit, 1.3. Sheep eat, uh, they weigh about uh, one fifth of a cow. So they eat about one fifth of a cow. So it takes five sheep to make one animal unit. You can do this for almost any animal on the range, including jackrabbits. And uh, someone published at one time that it would take 50 jackrabbits to make an animal unit. It's also cool to think of this sort of in the in, in the other way, which we call an animal unit equivalent. And this is a factor that reflects the number of animal units in the average animal. So again, a thousand pound cow would be one animal unit. A horse would be 1.8 animal units. A yearling steer would be a fraction of an animal unit maybe 7.75. Uh, a sheep would be 0.2 of an animal unit and a jacket would be 0.02. So you kind of look at it both ways, but you get the idea. Uh, these animal unit equivalents have been described for many types of animals. Again, you get the idea that um, uh, a 1,000 pound cow with a calf would be one animal unit. Uh, when she's dry, she would be less than an animal unit. A bull is heavy, they're, they're big animals, they eat a lot, so they're 1.35 animal units. Um, a really, a sheep, again, is 0.2, it takes five sheep to make an animal unit. Uh, it can be used for wildlife, like um, white-tailed deer. A mature white-tailed deer might be a 0.15 animal units, or about six deer equals an animal unit. Uh, a mature bison, about a thousand pound bison, would be about the same as a cow. So you get this sense, you get this the gist of what animal unit equivalent um, uh, describes in this table. Okay, so another way to look at animal demand is not not so much in animal units, but um, in trying to understand how much animals eat in a day. And one thing we know from what we've discussed previously in this class is that ruminants eat a certain percent of body weight a day on a yearly basis. And we said that they eat about two and a half percent of their body weight each day of dry matter forage. Um, horses and rabbits are hindgut fermenters, and because of their digestive system, they eat more than a ruminants. They eat about 3% of their body weight per day. Okay, so if that's true, then we have this term, an animal unit month. It's the amount of forage an animal unit will eat in a month, AUM, animal unit month. I want to forage an animal eats in a month. So if you have an animal... Uh, an animal unit that grazes and eats two and a half percent of its body weight for a month or 30 days, how many pounds is an animal unit? Think about it, it's just a little bit of math. So each animal unit um, weighs how much? A thousand pounds. They eat two and a half percent of their body weight each day, which means they eat 25 pounds a day. If an animal unit is the amount that they eat in a month, then they eat 25 pounds a day times 30 days, so 750 pounds. So the number that we'll use in this class is that an animal unit month equals 750 pounds of forage. Remember, an animal unit is a thousand pound animal. An animal unit month is in a unit of forage. It's 750 pounds of forage. To be honest with you, um, different agencies have different numbers for what um, that AUM is. For example, the Natural Resources Conservation Service uses 780. They're a little more conservative on what an AUM is. Other people might use less or more, but for this class, we're just going to focus on that 750 because it it's really relates to how much an animal eats per day. So put that in your brain. An animal unit month equals 750 pounds of forage. So now let's talk about stocking rates. How do we actually um, you know, balance that supply and demand. How do we actually set a stocking rate? Well, we're going to describe just a really simple four-step step method, um, and you'll be able to use this in class on different projects. 
Uh, the forage demand method is a simple method where you calculate the usable forage, you make any adjustments for water, terrain, or other constraints, then you calculate the demand of the animal, and you calculate the forage, the stocking rate, which is that supply and demand balance. So I'm going to walk you through those four steps. I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of background, though, even though this is kind of a simple method, it's not one we use very often. Most often, Stocking rates are set on what, what has been done in the past and whether it's working or not. But you might use this forage demand method when you have no information on previous years. Say you bought a, a new place or a place that hadn't been grazed in a number of years. You might also use it um, to calculate carrying capacity for a land appraisal. So let's say you want to sell the ranch. Rather than telling them how many cows you graze, you might want to know what it's capable of grazing. And then also you might use uh, this forage demand method when you are thinking about changing the type of livestock or the type of animals you graze. Say you want to change from sheep to cattle, then you might want to go back to the basics and, and calculate with this forage demand method. So let's start through these first four steps. The first is to calculate usable supply of forage. At the, the very first place to start is to take a look at how what your biomass supply is. You take the weight of biomass per acre and you time and you multiply it by the total area on your ranch in acres or the total area you're managing and that'll give you the total supply in pounds or in kilograms so you can get that weight of biomass by clipping grass or you can get it from uh, some book values re related to the soil and the precipitation that's a pretty simple approach to get the amount per acre multiply by acres get total biomass but there's a caveat. You can't use all the grass that's out on the range. You have to leave some behind. Generally, we definitely recommend that you leave some forage behind for the health and regrowth of the plant. If you keep grazing it down to the ground, it won't have the photosynthetic material it needs to recover. You also want to leave some forage behind for livestock. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, for wildlife. Livestock are not the only thing out on the range. You want to leave some for those large ruminant livestock like elk and deer, but you also want to leave some forage for the grasshoppers and the jackrabbits. So when you were setting a proper stock right, you need to make sure that the wildlife are provided for. And finally, you have to have some um, biomass that falls over on the ground and creates organic matter, helps to prevent erosion and really keep soil healthy. This diagram shows that you need to, if you remove the leaves, you affect the roots. So you need to set a stocking rate that somehow keeps the roots healthy because when the roots are healthy you don't have a lot of invasive plants and you keep the soil in a really productive state so we have to set a proper use factor we cannot take all of it but how much can we take well uh, the idea of a proper use factor is that we're going to set the stocking rate somewhere below carrying capacity to keep the land healthy on a long-term basis and there have been studies done across the West, and uh, these are some general numbers that have come across them. On sagebrush steppe grassland, scientists working in this region have said you can take 34, 30 to 40% of the annual production every year, and the land will still stay healthy. It will still continue to reproduce and do well. The shortgrass prairie is in, you know, on the east side of the Rockies, and it's an area that had very heavy bison grazing in its evolution and the plants are very resistant to grazing. So you can take more in the plains than you can on, on the west side of the Rockies. In the plains, you, those lands can sustain 40 to 50% um, removal every year and still remain healthy. When you get up into the mountains, both coniferous forests and maybe at those bench lands, oak woodlands, a lot of the ecosystems that we would deal with in the inner mountain west, 30 to 40 would be a pretty good number. So uh, in the, some of the readings that we've had, uh, you can look for research that relates to these. But in general, in west of the Rockies, we're talking about 30 to 40 percent of, of uh, biomass that can be used every year under a proper use idea so that it would sustain those lands into the future. So we're going to go back to that basic stocking rate. Uh, if you take all the amount that you have and you multiply it times the recommended use, you'll get the usable forage. That's the allowable use or recommended use level that you're going to be able to use on the land. And it should give you not the total amount of forage, but the usable forage supply. 
So do the math. First, we talked about the weight of biomass per acre times acres for the total biomass supply. Now convert that by taking the total biomass and multiplying it by that proper use factor. And then you'll get the total forage supply on your management unit. So now we're ready to calculate the usable supply of forage. Let's take an example. Let's suppose you manage a 1,200 acre ranch and its average production is 500 pounds per acre. And you've decided since you live in the sagebrush step that you can use about 30% of it. So what's your usable forage supply? Your ranch is 1,200 acres. It produces 500 pounds per acre. If you multiply those two, you get 600,000 pounds of biomass. So that's how much is totally out there. It could be used, but you're only going to use 30% of it in order to maintain the supply of forage for wildlife and for residue for the soil and, and for the plants themselves. So if you use 30% of that, then you have 180,000 pounds of forage to use. So again, this is when we think about pounds. We could also express this in terms of animal unit months of forage. Remember, an AUM is a unit of forage. How much is it again? Can you remember? It's 750 pounds. The amount that a 1,000 pound animal would eat in a month is 750 pounds. So how many AUMs are there in your 180,000 pounds of forage per your unit, per your ranch? 180,000 pounds of forage divided by 750 is 240 AUMs in the pasture or in the unit. So the next step then is to make sure that all the forage that you're accounting for in your equation is actually available to the animals. And one thing we know is that animals don't like to travel too far from water. So some book values that have been described uh, would be that if, an, if land is within a mile of water, you don't have to make any reduction to grazing capacity. It's all available. If it's one to two miles from water, then, then not all of it's available. The animals are not going to go as far to find it. So you have to reduce that amount by 50%. If it's over two miles from water, this author, Holacek, says the animals really won't use it at all. So you can't even consider that forage there because it's really not available. So I'll only say one thing is that it really depends on the animal and the land, depending on how steep the land is, how, how easy it is to walk, and then, of course, what the animals themselves uh, feel is right. Some, some animals will travel further from water. Plus the forage sometimes has a lot of water in it. So there's a lot of if, ands, and buts when you come up with these equations. But it is important to realize that not everything in the pasture is available to animals. And part of that is because of the distance to water. When you're trying to figure out how much of a pasture animals we use, uh, this is a, an example of a, a pattern use map where we're trying to see how does use um, look like across this whole pasture. And you'll see that there's this area of really concentrated use, this pink area. And that concentrated use is probably because of a water tank. As you move out from that, the yellow would be moderate, and then green is light, and blue is slight. And then as you get further and further away, you could consider that land sort of inaccessible or unusable. So the point here is that even though you calculate the amount of available forage on your unit, not all of it's actually available and you have to account for distance from water. Another adjustment that you might need to make is slope. Um, really steep country is not very well used by most livestock. So uh, again, just kind of book values for how much of that you can use. Uh, the, um, the Holacek in his book, recommends that a slope that is zero to ten percent there's no change animals can use that completely you don't need to reduce the carrying capacity of the ranch if it's 11 to 30 percent slope then it starts to be a little more access less accessible so probably 30 percent if that would be available and if it's 31 to 60 percent slope then only 60 percent is available or it has to be reduced o only 40 percent is available so you have to reduce the amount of carrying capacity by 60 percent and when the slope is over 60%, then it's essentially not usable. So you have to reduce by 100%. So here's a map, uh, again, that would, that would just kind of describe what areas of the ranch are used, uh, the areas that are low and level versus the areas that are not very well used and not really available to grazing because they're too steep. Uh, so uh, you can see where you could map on your 
uh, pasture areas that were usable or not usable, depending on how steep they are. So the, again, the second step is to make some adjustments due to slope and distance from water, but the, these guidelines are not rules. Uh, it really depends a lot on the species, the breed, and the experience. This, mat, this picture here is some cows near Riggins, and those cows, they, they just grew up using really steep country, and they don't know anything differently. And so cows from the plains that grew up on level ground wouldn't know what to do with this, but these cows are able to distribute relatively well. So that species and where they came from could affect how they use this landscape. Topography and soils could also affect it too. Uh, sandy soils are a little harder for animals to walk on than, than more firm soils or that, that steepness. And then finally, the season of grazing, especially um, the water, the amount of water. In the spring, the forage has so much water that animals can further travel quite a lot further uh, from a water source or a water tank than later in the season when it's hotter and drier. So again, these are guidelines. It's really important to look at your pasture and decide in the time that I'm grazing it, what are the factors that are going to influence the accessibility of forage? Okay, now we're ready to move on to step three. We know what our accessible and usable forage is. Now let's figure out what the demand is. How much do those animals need? So in review, animals um, have a weight and ruminants that eat ten, generally eat about two and a half percent of their body weight per day in dry matter. Hind gut fermenters, we assume, eat about three percent. Of course, that varies throughout the year, but on average, it would be two and a half and three percent. So to get the forage demand, you just have to take the weight of animals times the daily um, matter intake times the number of days they're on the pasture and will be grazed, and then you'll get the forage demand per animal per season. So here's an example. Uh, if an average cow on your ranch raises a thousand pounds and you're going to graze it for 30 months, for, I'm sorry, for three months or 90 days, how much forage would you expect them to eat? A thousand pound cow, she eats two and a half percent of her body weight per day. That means 25 pounds a day times 90 days means that in the whole grazing season of three months, she'll eat 2,250 pounds. So how many AUMs is that? Remember, we can express demand in animal unit months. And remember that an animal unit month is 750 pounds of forage. A uh, thousand pound animal eats two and a half percent of her body weight per day. That's 25 pounds times 30 days is 750. AUM, the amount of forage an animal eats in a month. So how many AUMs are there in that 2,250 pound that we know a forage, uh, a forage a cow will eat? So you take 2,250 pounds and you divide it by 750 because that's what's in an AUM and you get three AUMs. So each cow is out there for three months, so she's going to eat three AUMs of forage. Let's go to step four then. Now we have the supply and the demand. Now what is the actual stocking rate? How many cows should you have in your herd if your usable forage is 180,000 pounds per pasture? and the forage demand for each cow is 2,250. Well, your forage supply is 180,000 pounds. Your forage demand is 2,250 pounds per cow. That means you need 80 cows. Simple math. You know how much you have. You divide by how much each animal eats, and your stocking rate will be 80 cows per season of three months on your pasture or ranch. Again, you could also calculate this in AUMs. You know that your base herd has 240 AUMs in supply, and you know that each cow requires three AUMs. So 240 AUMs supply, three AUMs demand means 80 cows. So no matter how you calculate it, you'll come up with 80 cows. So just going back to what I said, when, you, um, when you're going to report a stocking rate, you need to know a number of animals, an area of land, and a period of days. And it's very important, and we'll often um, describe this in terms of AUMs per acre. Okay, go, now let's talk a little bit more about why it's important. So proper stocking rate is really important from a rangeland health standpoint uh, because we need to leave enough forage behind for the plants, for wildlife, and to make sure that we don't have excessive erosion. This is all based on the idea that we need to have active leaves to support active roots. 
Now, two words that we should distinguish. Overgrazing is not overstocking. So when you're driving down the road and you see a pasture that seems really like there's just not much forage there, um, it may not be overgrazed. It might be that the area was just really heavily grazed for some management procedure, um, like weed control or something. Um, but overgrazing occurs when you have that repeated heavy grazing that will really um, create damage in the plant community. Overstocking, on their hand, is just really heavy stocking during a very specific time of year so that it looks very observable, but we don't know that it's overgrazing until it causes damage. So overstocking does not always lead to overgrazing. In fact, sometimes overstocking is an important management decision. <clears throat> On the other side of the coin, remember that um, rangelands are grazed ecosystems and overresting or excessive resting from grazing can also be a problem. Some uh, areas, I've seen it in riparian areas and a few kind of high precipitation areas where if it's not grazed, it just doesn't healthy. The plants can't come get, can't come up through that thatch and you can see a situation where the, the plants just don't seem very healthy. So excessive resting can be as bad as overgrazing. So why is the proper stocking rate important for a uh, animal production standpoint? Well, um, if you look at this graph, you know that you can see that on at a low stocking rate, animals produce the, just exactly what they're able to produce, their genetic potential. And then at some point between sort of a low and moderate rate, um, every more, as the stocking rate gets higher and higher and there's more and more animals in that pasture, uh, you're going to see each animal not gain as well as they could. And then at some point, there's going to be a rapid decline where you throw, put another animal on the ranch and all the animals are going to come back thinner. So let's focus on this kind of um, flux point where as you start to put more animals on the ground, on the pasture, uh, you, every, every animal comes back less less heavy. What, why is that? Why as you increase stocking rate do individual animals respond by not getting as fat as they could? There's a few reasons. Uh, first, of the, as you get more animals in the pasture, there's simply less forage per animal. And then they choose among all that forage and their diet quality is lower because they can't get the best of the quality forage out there. Plus, there's more energy required to get that forage. They may have to travel further. They may have to go up to slope a little bit further than they would like. They may even have to just chew longer because it's lower quality. So they expend more energy to get what they can. And then finally, when you get a lot of animals in a small space, you can start to have issues with stress and disease uh, where animals are passing diseases around and they, they just might be stressed because of the high number of animals in the area. So this doesn't happen until you get to really heavy stocking rates, but there is a point where when you add another animal to pasture, all of the animals suffer because they can't get enough forage, their diet quality is lower, it takes more energy to get the diet, and they're stressed and, and disease control. Um, okay, this is all fine and good. We've talked about what is the stock rate, calculating a stocking rate. The problem is, that really varies from year to year. There's no, there's not really a long-term average that you can just count on every year. Yeah, there is an average, but you can't say that every year you're going to get that amount. So what do you do? What do you do if you live in a world of variability? First of all, you really have to acknowledge that it, it's huge. Here's some graphs from uh, near Twin Falls, kind of actually a little past Burley, uh, and it's you can see these pastures. You can see this. Uh, there's a a, a, a power line in the back, a wooden post, so you can kind of see that they're all being taken from the same spot. And in 1957, there was about 11 inches of rain, and the pasture got about 850 pounds per acre. In a couple of years later, there was about the same amount of rain. It was 11 inches, but the forage production was half what it had been in 57. So something happened. The, the rain came at the wrong time of year. Maybe there were some other events, but there's a lot less forage in 59 than there was in 57. Oh, but my gosh, look at the next year, 1960. There's almost no forage out there. I don't think you could even really uh, rightfully think about putting animals out on this pasture. It's 186 pounds per acre. It, there's just nothing for them to eat. And then just a, a few years later, we had a bo boon year in 1971 where there was 16 inches of precipitation. It must have come at the right time because 
the precipitation was over a thousand pounds. So here's a pasture where some years it's close to a hundred or two hundred pounds, and other years it's close to a thousand pounds. That is a challenge to do the management in that kind of situation. So how do you set stocking rate amidst this incredible variability? And this is where the art and science of random management comes along. Yes, it's a science. We can measure these things, but it's really an art to figure out how do you really go about raising livestock in this amount of variability. So going back to this idea of variation from year to year, how might you accomplish that? Well, one idea is to try to really be nimble and flexible. Ranchers that do this try to keep only about a little more than half of their herd in breeding stock in cows and calves or sheep and lambs. Then they also, they always kind of a, um, have a, a part of the stocking rate that could be accomplished in good years with steers or stalker animals. So that's one way to be flexible. Another, another thing you could be flexible with is having early year weaning in years when it's a bad year, you can wean calves off a little early. If you just really are dead set against having a really same amount of cattle from year to year, that fits into your lifestyle, it just seems right to you. For whatever reason, you want to have a stocking rate that stays really level from, stain, from year to year. If you want to do that, just think about the fact that you're going to need to set stocking rate well below carrying capacity. So the herd should be set so that it could be it could survive at times when you're 25% below average. Knowing that some years you might also have to supplement and do some other things, uh, that will be the price you pay for having a constant stocking rate. All this is fine and good, but I think the way it should work on range is you set a stocking rate and then monitor, monitor, monitor. See if you're on track. So. Uh, do it by trial and error for a few years, and then monitor range trend. Uh, use caution if you're just estimating carrying capacity. Combine utilization measurements and interpretations of the range, knowledge of past and present stocking rates. Monitor, meaning go out there, take some photos, do some collections to see if you're on track, and then adjust when needed. So that's the idea is that range management is not about just setting a perfect stocking rate and walking away. It's about setting a reasonable stocking rate and then seeing if it was right and making changes as necessary. You don't have to do much in range management, whether you're managing livestock or wildlife, before you realize that the number of animals that are out on the range is going to affect the range and the animals, and it's important to manage the stocking rate of animals. So in this presentation, in principles of rangeland management at the University of Idaho, we're going to talk about setting stocking rates. I'm Karen Launchbaugh.